were naturally scared. It was a, it was a life and death situation. The whole of your life was life and death. Uh, will you be able to get round the corner? Will there be an anti-tank gun around there? Because I used to drive a bring gun carrier and an anti-tank gun would fire at me, would just wipe me off the face of the earth. Together, the veterans sailed once more across the English Channel. Tony Colgan was just 20 when he made this journey for the first time, 70 years and a lifetime ago. He's come back with his grandson, Anthony, who wants to know more about his grandfather's war before it's too late to ask. When I actually got aboard the uh, craft, uh, we were on it for three days before we landed and it was uh, no food except what you were carrying yourself and it was a bit on the rough side and we had to just stay there until they, they decided that the invasion was on. Just over there we landed and we came up the beach and turned left. There was a line of six carriers, Yeah. two carrying uh, Brain guns, two carrying six pound anti tank guns, mm -hmm. and two three inch mortars, plus a little 15 hundred weight truck behind us. To, I don't know what was in that, I'm sure. But, uh, was that when you landed? That, that's we all landed together, and that's what how we formed up for, uh, for what, our advance inwards. What was it like on the beach? Um, well, there was a beach master here, looking a bit scared, I must say. Yeah. But he, his job was just to stay on the beach um, and to direct all the traffic there. You the could do nothing but concentrate on actually what you were doing. Uh, a job in hand was the most important thing in your life. And that, didn't, that meant losing it if necessary. Uh, although nobody wanted to do that, of course. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it was just intense in, intense looking at uh, what you were doing am i in the right gear was i going fast enough or was i going too fast or or uh, where do i go now you see and, and and that kind of thing and eventually it sorted itself out in your mind and you've got people directing you to where to go and uh, it was full of um, it was full of intense thought. Where do I go? Who do I go to? Who are they going to shoot at us? Or, uh, and, and all that kind. Of. You don't do anything wrong. It was just fatal to do something wrong, uh, or so you felt. And, and you just followed the man in front. Let's get to where we're going quick as we can. You know, let's before we get shot by a German. And no Germans were around. And there was all hell breaking loose when we were about a mile offshore and then I thought this is your last day you, you're just not going to get out of this and then all of a sudden as we came to the shore it went dead quiet and there was no firing or anything like that just for a matter of a, a minute or two from when you landed when you came off the boat on the brain gun carrier yeah. on a universal carrier how long until you got off the beach how long were you on the beach for or a matter of minutes, that's all. So it was, yeah. it was as quick as that? Yeah, yeah. And did you see anything five, on the beach? Five minutes on the beach, that was all. The, uh, as soon as we got off, yeah. as soon as we got off the actual invasion car, yeah. we were into about four foot of water. Okay. Four or five foot of water. But you didn't get wet? Yeah, we didn't get wet, no, no. Because no. we were waterproofed our carriers and we got sheets of, of metal. Oh yeah. That, uh, allowed us to go into deeper water. It's weird to imagine that he was a 20 year old kid running onto this beach or getting or driving onto this beach and uh, experiencing what he's describing. So it's important to try and remember as much as we, as we can so that I can pass that information on to his great grandchildren and great great grandchildren. Surviving D-Day was just the start. Only a week later, Tony helped liberate this Normandy village in a crucial Allied victory. We were down 
this road here and there was a tank there knocked out and that's it we didn't go any further it was damn too damn dangerous that's why and who's who was in the tank it was german tank who was ever in it was dead yes that's for sure yeah and how long had it taken you to get here because you'd landed on the beach what happened after that well uh actually we went into tillis ourselves and uh, that was rather docked about a bit but we were there for six days before we they decided Longev needed knocking out and, uh, and, and uh, we actually attacked Longev on the 13th but we got a bit of a bloody nose about it so we held off until the next day where we put in a full uh, artillery barrage the whole division of artillery landed on this village uh, and, uh, typhoons uh, were coming in as well and any German who saw a typhoon directing at his tank would abandon the tank as a, no contest no contest whatsoever and uh, what were you thinking at the time did you think you'd survive I don't know I don't know why <laughs> probably because I'm a good lad <laughs> But were you worried? Were you scared a lot of the time? We were scared all the time. We were naturally scared. It was a, it was a life and death situation. Your whole of your life was life and death. Uh, will you be able to get round the corner? Will there be a tank anti tank gun around there? Because I used to drive a brain gun carrier, and an anti tank gun would find at me would just wipe me off the face of the earth. Yeah, just this is no chance of, of it uh, getting away with it. And then the RAF decided after we'd been on the road for about half an hour that they would, um, they didn't like the look of us so they, uh, one of them peeled off and dropped a bomb behind us and wrote off our 1500 weight truck and then machine gunned the whole column and missed everybody. Sorry RAF but that's actually what happened. <laughs> so you were lucky not to be killed by your own side? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, oh yes. I, I can watch, I can even now uh, watch the bullets uh, hitting the ground uh, beside us, you know, and missing, thank goodness. Well. What, what happened here then? You say you came to there and you saw a German tank, but German was dead. German what? was dead and there was, well, we didn't get any further, we didn't get any further. Uh, infantry, infantry would be uh, involved, uh, we weren't really infantry, we were only three inch mortars, you see. And uh, that made all the difference in the world, yeah. Being three inch mortars made you comparatively safe because you didn't, you weren't a front line man. Yeah. Yeah. And what was the welcome like in the village? Did you see French no, civilians? No, not a single civilian about here. Really? It, oh no, it wasn't at all. Yeah. And th this battle had been going for two days, remember? Yeah, it's the 13th and the 14th and if you look on the gravestones in the, uh, in the Bayer Cemetery you'll see uh, the downright infantry killed the 13th or could have one on the 14th and you know what battle they were actually in, that was the Battle of Alonso. Yeah. Why did this matter here? Why was it important to take it? Did you understand I, what I, was happening? I don't know they were, because uh, just not far down the road there was another unit whom I don't know and never did find out anyway and uh, but once this was over it seemed as if uh, the thing calmed down a bit and we were only in, in patrolling uh, situation as it were what was morale like did you oh, know at that stage that things were no, going there was your no way problem, no problem with morale whatsoever uh, everybody knew we were going to win the war the fact that you might get killed doing it it didn't really uh, come into it you know, but it was no question about it. We were going to win, and why the Germans couldn't understand that we could never understand ourselves. Yes. <laughs> Did you meet any Germans who were alive who surrendered or? Well, the, the, uh, we never used to handle them. They used to pass through, and we saw you see the infantry uh, taking, say, half a dozen uh, uh, Germans to prisoner. Uh, they were mostly in morale morale was rotten you know for them yeah. and you get the occasional you get an officer whom you uh, I have heard the tale you would offer them a cigarette and they would um, 
they would spit it out or, or spit at you or something like that, you know. But it didn't happen very often though. Parade! Parade! Ten! shall grow not all as we that are left grow age shall not worry them nor the years condemn at the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them you're so lucky you and Jim that you managed to stay alive aren't you as the Durham Light Infantry, Tony's unit, pushed further inland in the weeks after D-Day, the toll of the wounded and the dead rose quickly. That tree there is where the colonel's buried. Okay. Which tree is that? That second tree in. What was his name? Colonel Woods, yeah. Colonel right, okay. Woods, yeah. And did he die on D-Day? No, he, he died a week later at Longev. Oh, really? Yeah, he was commanding officer and he was killed. Okay. Day, yeah. Well, we lost 200 men over in one day, so there must 200. be 200. He's 27. He's 19. 19. 19. Yeah. It's yeah. just amazing. It's just extraordinary that they. Uh, They've had not had a life. No. Yeah. They didn't have a life. A life. Yeah. Yeah. This is underneath. Look, tell England ye who pass his monument, he died for England, and here he rests content. It can be emotional. It is, isn't it? Yes, it's alright. <laughs> oh man, you made me cry now. Yeah. Jeez, Grandad. Imagine, all of a sudden, all the gravestones fell over and the fellas stood up. Yeah. There'd be a hell of a lot of men, wouldn't there? As D-Day fades from living memory, Tony's grandson will also do his duty to remember and pass on what his grandfather and his comrades achieved at such a cost. <laughs>